last video, we asked, what is knowledge of language? And we got a pretty good idea of all the various types of knowledge of language that people seem to have, some universal to the entire human species and some specific to speakers of an individual language. And we were talking a lot about language as a property of the human mind. And that is exactly what we're going to go into a little bit more detail about in this video. In this video, we're going to look at what we mean when we say we study human language as a property of the human mind versus some of the other things that the mind does and that people commonly perceive as perhaps being in the remit of linguistics, but that really aren't. So what do we mean when we say we study language as a property of the human mind? Well, really what we're saying is we're interested in the human mind's ability, or in other words, in the human mind's faculty to produce and store and comprehend language. So this is called the language faculty. Now, people are sometimes a little bit fuzzy about what they mean when they say the mind, and we all have various ideas of what we mean with that. Steven Pinker very famously said, the mind is what the brain does. The mind is the function of the brain that is responsible for the storage and computation of information. And it turns out that the mind is organized into a number of components that are specialized for storing different types of information and computing different types of information. Language, of course, is one such specialized function of the mind. And not just that, in fact, language itself can be broken up into the components of knowledge of language that we encountered earlier. So there is a component that is responsible for computing and storing information about sentence structure, about word structure, about sound structure, about meaning, and so on. So the language faculty is the component of the human mind that is exclusively dedicated to the storage and computation of linguistic information. So to get a better grip of what the language faculty is all about, we might as well ask, what is the language faculty not? Specifically, what sort of thing that the mind could plausibly do is not equivalent to the language faculty. And we'll be making a couple of claims that we'll investigate in turn. First, the language faculty is not general intelligence. The language faculty is not thought. The language faculty is not literacy. And the language faculty, most certainly, is not what is known as consisting of prescriptive rules. So let's take these in turns. General intelligence. The claim is that language faculty and general intelligence are completely separate entities in the mind. We get evidence for this from what we call double dissociation. For example, when we have two patients with brain injury, for one patient, the language is impaired, but the general intelligence is still all right. The general intelligence is largely unaffected. And then we have another patient where the language faculty is unaffected and they can still fluently speak and produce uh, speech and comprehend what they're taught within the remits of the other problems that they might show. However, their general intelligence is severely impaired. Then we have a factor of comparison where we can say, well, from the first case, we see that general intelligence is not affected when language is affected. And then from the second patient, we can see that general intelligence can be affected without affecting language. And so we can reason that from this double dissociation, language and general intelligence must be different components of the human mind and ultimately refer to different structures in the human brain because one can be affected without affecting the other. So therefore, language and the language faculty is not equivalent to general intelligence. So to give you an example of someone whose language faculty is completely unaffected, but who has severe difficulties with general intelligence, we're going to look at a documentary now of 
a young man called Christopher, who was studied extensively by Neil Smith, a emeritus professor here at the UCL linguistics department, who spent many a year studying Christopher and working with him. Christopher is brain damaged. He is institutionalized because he cannot take care of himself. Yet Christopher taught himself to read, write, and communicate in more than 15 languages. Hey, can you tell me what that says, Steve? Very good. And what's striking about Christopher is, on the one hand, his ability to master languages and his inability to solve ordinary problems. Professor Neil Smith is co-author of The Mind of a Savant, Language Learning and Modularity. He has spent years studying Christopher. Christopher is now 35 years old. He's been living in sheltered accommodation for many years because he can't look after himself. He has very serious problems of hand-eye coordination. He can't do up his own buttons. He can't shave himself. He can't cross the road alone. He can't dress himself. He's not particularly well adapted to living at all on his own. He has an IQ that ranges between 40 and 120, depending on how you test it. Barely able to function in every other respect, Christopher has a genius for language, to the point where he can read upside down and sideways, just as well as he can read right side up. He is very fluent in languages like French, German, Spanish, Italian, modern Greek, Polish. He's reasonably good in languages like Dutch and Hindi. It's very hard to tell. He's got quite a good knowledge of Turkish, not such a good knowledge of Finnish, a little bit of Welsh. We've taught him some Berber and a number of other languages as well. And these languages are written with various different scripts. So modern Greek and Russian and Hindi use three different scripts, none of them the Roman script. The combination of Christopher's limited personal skills with his heightened language skills is unique. Most servants have no talent for language. In fact, most of them have very impoverished language. But with Christopher, his one talent is languages. And when he meets you, he wants to know how many languages you speak. It's usually his first question. Christopher's limitations can create problems, but his skills sometimes save the day. One of his difficulties is that he gets lost very easily. When his sister took him on holiday to Mallorca some years ago, they went to their hotel, and after a few minutes, Christopher was lost, and so they were obviously worried about where he was. A few minutes later, they found him. He was happily talking to the German tourists and translating between German and Spanish to help them. He couldn't find his way to his bedroom, but he could act as inter interpreter for German tourists between Spanish and German. So, as you can see, the case of Christopher provides an extreme example of dissociation of the language faculty from general intelligence. Here we have someone who is a savant, someone who is incredibly, exceptionally skilled in the languages domain, and yet is suffering from severe deprivation in the area of general intelligence. Now, the second claim we made was that language is independent from thought. People often think that thought in some way is dependent on language because as humans, as linguistic beings, we so often use language in our thought processes. We so often construct sentences in our mind or chew through a problem verbally in our mind. However, non-linguistic organisms are clearly also able to have thought processes. For example, pre-linguistic babies, babies that haven't acquired a language yet are clearly able to take part in some processes in some interactions with their environment that imply that they have thought. Similarly, anyone who has a pet will be quite assured that their pet has some sort of thought process, even if those are different from humans. And by and large, anything in the animal kingdom really has some sort of thought process. On the other side, Linguistic organisms, such as mature humans, are also able to think non-linguistically. Einstein, 
was quite famous for deriding the idea that he could ever come up with any of his theories if he had thought of them in terms of words and language. In fact, he said, the most difficult thing that he had to do when he wrote his first paper in special relativity was to try and put his ideas into words. On a more simple and fundamental level, there are tasks such as mental rotation that we can perform as humans that clearly don't require language and which language is probably not even helpful. So for example, if you look at this graphic here, you can see that the object on the bottom right is the same as the gray object at the top and that it doesn't match the object on the bottom left. You will notice pretty straight away looking at them and you will also figure out pretty quickly that it was rotated around the left and not mirrored or flipped or something else. So you have the ability to take some sort of image and turn it around in your mind's eye and manipulate that object without using language at all. This also is thought. And so thought is independent of language, even though language can feature and be used in thought. Now, another thing that people will often equate with the language faculty or language ability is literacy, the ability to read and write well. Well, learning to read and write a language is quite different from learning to speak and understand a language. Learning to read and write a language requires rich input. You need to be taught very explicitly how the spelling system of your language works, especially if you're learning a language like English where a lot of the spellings for words are unpredictable. It requires formal instruction. There isn't a critical period for learning to read and write. In fact, whether you learn to read and write when you're 10 years old or whether you're 50 years old, with the same amount of practice and the same general ability, you will achieve the same level of fluency in reading and writing along a certain path of time. Now let's compare this to learning to speak and understand a language. Well, learning to understand and speak a language does not require particularly rich input. In fact, the input that children receive when they learn their language is quite impoverished in some ways. For example, we never receive evidence of what is really not possible in language. Your parents never sit you down and tell you that you must not put the object before the verb if you're an English speaker or that because you're a Portuguese speaker, even though it's Indo-European and you have fixed word order, you must not strand prepositions. There is something that we'll encounter later along the line called the poverty of the stimulus, which is one of the fundamental arguments that has been made about the lack of a rich enough input into humans when they learn language. Learning to understand and speak a language, at least as a first language, does not require any formal instruction. Even though in some societies, parents and people around will give some degree of feedback, there are also other societies where children are largely ignored and left to their own devices and parents will never correct them or anything. Nonetheless, children have no problem acquiring the languages that are around them. If they're exposed to that language and have some sort of level of interaction, with that language, whilst they go up for long enough, they will pick up that language. Instruction, no instruction, it does not matter. The learning of language in humans also proceeds along a biologically predetermined schedule. Children of a certain age or babies of a certain age will acquire certain portions of language and certain rules of the languages around them at largely the same time as their peers of the same age. And more importantly than that, there comes an age around the entry of puberty when children, if they are then exposed to a new language, will never quite acquire the language to the same degree that they will acquire languages that they've been exposed before they came into that critical period. The idea of a critical period of a time when it becomes almost too late to learn your first language 
is something that we'll encounter later on in our course as well, and that you will encounter variously in your studies of linguistics and psychology. A famous example that we'll encounter later on is the case of a child called Genie, who was a feral child, abandoned and not exposed to language, and then later rescued um, around the time of her puberty. And she had extensive instruction, but she never quite got around to learn language in the way that a child exposed to language would have. Now, as linguists, we often find ourselves in the enterprise of grammar. And when our friends outside the linguistic circle know that we have to do with grammar, they often think of us as the people who tell them how they ought to speak and how their language ought to sound and how things ought to be pronounced. But that is decidedly not what we do. Prescriptive rules are rules that tell people how they ought to speak. And when they are put together, then they constitute what we will call a prescriptive grammar. Now, prescriptive grammars are not entirely pointless. They are useful, for example, for learners of a second language, because they need quite explicit instruction on what it is that one would say in that situation and how a sentence ought to be formed if you want to be recognized as a good speaker of that language versus just being understood. Prescriptive grammars can also be useful for native speakers. For example, when you grow up and you speak a certain register that is associated perhaps with your class or with your upbringing, and you might want to break into a different social circle, it can be quite helpful to know what the rules are that you can conform to not to stick out like a sore thumb. However, what we're interested in as linguists are descriptive rules. We're in the business of describing how people actually speak, what they instinctively know about their language. And when we collect these descriptions of what people actually say and actually do, and the intuitions they actually have about their language, not what they think they ought to do and they ought to be like, when we put that together, then we get something that is called a descriptive grammar. And a descriptive grammar is basically the empirical database on which we will operate as linguists. These form the data and the phenomena that we are trying to explain. So, as I said, while prescriptive rules can be quite useful at times, sometimes they're also just downright nonsensical and mythical about what language is or how language ought to work. Let's look at a couple of these language myths slash silly prescriptive rules. One that you surely will have encountered is the double negative rule. Two negatives make a positive, so don't use double negatives. That is something that many of us will have been told when we were in school. But why should the rules of language be based on multiplication rather than addition? Yes, minus three times minus two is plus six, but minus three minus two is still minus five and not plus five. So why should language be based on multiplication, not in addition? Why should language be based on mathematics at all? Is there any reason to believe that mathematics is inherently tied to the use of language or vice versa? Now, even if we were to find an answer to that question, it's actually completely beside the point because we want to describe how language is actually used and how language is actually understood and not tell people how they ought to speak. And what is quite clear to anyone who has ever encountered a double negative in the real world is that people don't think that a double negative makes a positive. For example, if you hear the sentence, I ain't never seen nobody hold no knife. You know perfectly well that I mean that I have never seen anyone holding a knife. And more instructively, perhaps, you will probably have no idea how many negatives I had just used in that sentence and whether that would ultimately multiply out to being positive or being negative at the end. If you want a little exercise, pause the video here and go and write that sentence down. I ain't never seen nobody hold no knife and multiply out whether, according to the double negative rule, that sentence should be negative or positive.
Another rule you will have encountered as an English speaker is the split infinitive rule. Don't split infinitives. A basic lesson of every class in composition. Well, why do we have the split infinitive rule in the first place? Turns out it comes from scholars some time ago who thought that English ought to be something like Latin. And in Latin, of course, infinitives are part of an inflection on the word. So infinitives can't be split off. If you look at this example from Latin here, you have the verb to think in the infinitive, where the part that is to in English is formed by the little suffix re at the end of the word in cogitare in Latin. So this is an inherent part of the word, such as the ing in thinking in the continuous form in English, and therefore can't be split from the word. That's where these scholars got the idea from that you shouldn't split infinitives, because of course, English ought to be just like Latin, because Latin is, as we all know, the language of the high society. Well, English clearly marks infinitives in a totally different way to how Latin does it, and therefore enjoys liberties that Latin doesn't. And we can say that we want to boldly go where no man or no linguist has gone before, where a Latin speaker might not be able to say that. So the comparison with Latin is rather absurd, and you, as a speaker of English, should pride yourself in the ability to split your infinitives and to boldly go where no prescriptivist has ventured before. Now, to hark back a little bit to language as a property of the human mind, an important differentiation of concepts that we have to make and that figures with these things that we've just been teasing apart to some degree is the distinction between competence and performance. Competence is knowledge of language. What have you stored in your mind? What do you know about the rules of your language, about the word stock of your language, about the way in which meaning is constructed in your language? And we mean that in quite a perfect sense. Now, on the other side, there is performance. Performance is how this perfect knowledge of language in the mind is actually put to use. So when we actually speak or we actually write or we actually hear or read something and we make a mistake, that has nothing to say about the state of knowledge that we have perhaps, but more about the difficulties of externalizing and putting that knowledge to use a lot of the time. So it is quite important to make a distinction between the competence that someone has, between the actual knowledge they have of that language and their ability to actually practically use that at any one given time. So if you look at this little comic that we have here, a quite a good way to remember the competence versus performance distinction is that competence is what you have in your head and performance is what comes out of your mouth. Now, Another common misconception that is out there in the world is that language equals speech. And that is quite manifestly not true. The term speech refers only to the oral externalization of a spoken language. There are also many sign languages around the world, spoken principally by the deaf community, but there are also many signers, perhaps in heritage generations, or partially hearing impaired people, or just in small communities where there's a large proportion of deaf people, so it makes sense for the hearing people to also learn sign language. So sign languages are on an equal par with spoken languages as to regards of linguistics and to regards of what happens in the mind of those speakers as to the knowledge of language that is involved. There are many sign languages there are over 100 sign languages that have been well documented, and there are probably many, many more sign languages that we don't even know about yet. Sign languages share many of the underlying properties with oral language, especially the universal properties and some of the parameters that are applicable to languages generally are shared by sign languages. But of course, Languages, depending on the modality they use, are often able to do things that other languages in different modalities are not able to do. It's also important to note at this point that some languages allow 
variant externalizations. Languages can be realized often in more than one way. For example, there are spoken languages that can be drummed and or whistled. Piraha, the language has been studied by Dan Everett, and which he wrote a book about called Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes, that you might have come across, is quite a famous example of a language that has both a spoken, a drumming, and a whistling variant. Some signed languages, for example, can also be communicated by touch, something that often occurs in the deaf blind community. So to summarize what we've looked at this week, we've been looking at knowledge of language and language as a property of the human mind. And we have seen that knowing a language means knowing a wide range of facts from the sound structure to a word order to the way that meaning is perceived in one's language. And we've seen that linguists study this knowledge so as to gain a better understanding ultimately of what it is that the human mind does and what the abilities or faculties of the human mind are with regard to language. To put it another way, for linguists, human language is a window onto the human mind. Linguists focus specifically on the component of the mind which is dedicated to the storage and computation of linguistic information, which we called the language faculty. So I hope you've enjoyed this first dive into linguistics, and I will see you shortly at the first tutorial. I'm looking forward to meeting you.